Next up, we've got a discussion on EA funds. We've got three panelists, and Anjali will again be moderating this next session. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Kerry Vaughn. You've heard from Kerry before. He leads marketing and growth at the Center for Effective Altruism. He has a PhD in philosophy where he specialized in applied ethics and value theory. Before CEA, he ran technology and innovation at a $1.5 billion foundation and was also a professional poker player. Please welcome back Kerry Vaughn. Our next panelist is Nick Beckstead. Nick is the program officer for the Open Philanthropy Project, where he's responsible for grant making to support scientific research and the effective altruism community. He previously was a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute and studied philosophy in graduate school, where he wrote a dissertation on the importance of shaping the distant future. Please welcome back Nick Beckstead. Next up, we've got Lewis Bollard. Lewis leads the Open Philanthropy Project's strategy for farm animal welfare. Prior to joining Open Philanthropy, he worked as a policy advisor and international liaison to the CEO at the Humane Society of the United States. Before that, he was a litigation fellow for the Humane Society, a law student, and an associate, associate consultant at Bain & Company. He has a BA from Harvard in social studies and a JD from Yale Law School. Please welcome Lewis Bollard. And finally, welcome back to the stage to moderate, Anjali Gopal. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, just another quick reminder that we are taking questions from the audience for the session. So if you check the EA Global app, you'll be able to submit questions, which I'll read a little bit later on. Um, so just to give everyone a quick introduction to the panel, uh, this panel is named EA Funds. Um, and EA Funds is one of the newest initiatives of the Center for Effective Altruism, and it was launched in early February 2017. So um, since then, um, EA Funds has moved over $1.1 million into its recommended cause areas. And the rationale here is that effective altruists can donate um, to causes that they think have a better or equal opportunity for donation as the standard give oil recommended charities. Um, in addition to the $1.1 million moved, EA Funds also has $31,000 occurring in recurring donations each month. Um, so with us today, we have uh, Carrie, who's part of the Center for Effective Altruism, Nick, who is the fund manager for two of the funds, so this is the Long Term Future Fund and the Movement Building Fund, and Lewis, who is the manager of the Animal Welfare Fund. So um, what, some of the questions we'd like to ask is how this impacts donor coordination and other uh, earning to give issues in the EA community. Uh, so to get started, um, again, I gave you a brief background about the history of the fund. Kerry, can you give us some more information for why CEA chose to pursue this as a project? Sure. So um, we built EA funds while CEA was participating in the Y Combinator Startup Accelerator. And so one of the rationales for building EA funds is we thought the partners and people we were working with at Y Combinator would be uniquely suited to giving us advice on a thing that has a really concrete feedback loop like uh, moving money and causing the money to go to good places. So that was one sort of more practical rationale. Um, uh, a less practical rationale was we uh, were seeing a bunch of sort of demand for easier but still quite high impact donation options. So um, Nick was running a fund called the EA Giving Group where, it, where people would donate to that and then he would uh, sort of make allocations based on what he thought was, was worth giving to. Um, some people had set up a donor lottery where a bunch of people can donate money to a fund and then you select one of the people at random who gets to then decide where all the money gets donated and that was a way of incentivizing people to do more research per uh, you know, for the, for the money that they're donating. And so we were hoping to sort of solve some of those emerging problems that we saw in the EA community and kind of help people uh, not spend all of their time figuring out where to donate, but still have some really high quality options uh, despite that. And so to tail off of that, um, Nick and Lewis, in your roles as fund managers, um, can you give us a bit more information about how EA Funds has moved its money so far? Um, so, so far, uh, I've only made uh, one grant and that was through the Long-Term Future Fund uh, to support the Berkeley Existential Risk Initiative, which was started recently. I uh, used all the funds that were available for that uh, at the time, and um, you know, 
pulled from another couple of other sources available to make up the difference to the size of the grant that we wanted to make. Um, and uh, that's, so that's, it's, it's relatively new. That's the only grant so far. Yeah. Uh, so in animal welfare, we've done $200,000 worth of grants across 10 groups. And the aim of the first set of grants was really to show the kind of things we'll be funding through the EA Animal Welfare Fund. You can see the details on the EA Fund's website. The main priority has been to find groups beyond the Animal Charity Evaluator top charities, which I think are great uh, opportunities for giving for individual donors, but also to find other opportunities that individual donors may not be as aware of and provide them with a way to fund those. And following um, up off of that, what is your approach in choosing what to fund? Um, well, I guess uh, the, the criteria that I use are, it's, it's, it's relatively commonsensical. It's sort of, um, you know, how, how good do we feel about the people running this organization, the leadership? Uh, you know, try to get information about the plan that they're using uh, and try to assess how, how much sense that makes, look for uh, a track record, and look for funding need level. So, um, and then there's some kind of qualitative balancing of, you know, of all of those things and looking for something that scores higher on, on all of the metrics um, and uh, you know, go with the options that are available that, that meet that. And I guess that's, that's mostly determined through a combination of um, you know, it, having a network in the field and experience with it and conversations with, uh, with the possible grantee. Yeah, so we're similarly looking at the track record, looking at the team involved. With us, the, the main metric we're ultimately looking at is the potential to reduce animal suffering or improve animal well-being uh, as much as possible. And we're particularly looking to support a variety of approaches with impressive teams behind them. So I think the, the ACE Top Charities are a great place to start for individual donors. A lot of what we're doing for this fund is just providing some additional thoughts based on some of the time I spend on research, some of the thoughts we get from, from others uh, to kind of provide a, a diversified approach to that. So one of the conversations that have come up around this um, is that right now each of the funds is managed by a single fund manager. Um, and what sorts of benefits or drawbacks would you see of having uh, a single fund managed by multiple fund managers? And we'll start with Carrie. Yeah, so, um, I... hello, can you hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, so um, one, of the, one of the sort of costs of that is it adds a bunch of friction. Nobody can hear me, right? Hey. hey. <laughs> Hold on a second. Thank you. OK. Um, so one of the big costs of using, one of, <laughs> OK. Can you hear me? Cool. Uh, somebody wave at me if you can't hear me, because I, I, it's hard to hear uh, the feedback. Um, so one of the big costs using multiple fund managers is that it adds a lot of friction to the person managing the fund. So when we wanted to set up EA funds, uh, we, considered that very, we considered it very much a test of a concept, and we weren't sure whether that concept would work, and we didn't want to add a bunch of work to somebody who's already pretty busy, like, you know, like Lewis and Nick are, um, for a project that might not turn out to pan out. So um, we thought single fund manager was the lowest, lowest cost, lowest friction option. Um, as you add more people as additional managers to a fund, or if you have a multi-manager structure, the benefit you get is extra viewpoints, and the, one of the costs you get is more of a sort of regression to the mean, maybe less risk-taking, because when you reach consensus, often that results in the least objectionable option as opposed to maybe the one that's best in expectation. So I think it's, it's kind of an open question as to whether we should have multi-fund uh, managers on a single fund, um, but it's something I'd be interested in uh, exploring more and talking to people about if anybody has um, a viewpoint on whether we should or shouldn't do that. Um, so I, I think I see the, the pros and cons uh, relatively similarly to what Kerry said. Um, I think, you know, yeah, more boldness, decisiveness, uh, willingness to pursue unusual options with a single fund manager or a single decision maker on a fund. Um, and on the other side, just fewer view viewpoints are represented. I think if you wanted to have multiple people involved uh, in a given area, perhaps the best way of doing that would be to have um, 
you know, a couple of fund managers that have sort of sole discretion over their own budgets within the area. So uh, that could preserve some of the nimbleness and boldness and everything um, while getting some more viewpoints represented. And you know, then it's just a question of finding the right person for it. And it, I guess it's taking more time at that point. That's, so that's the, that's the other trade-off that has to be made. So I think you know, when the funds reach a certain size level, uh, I, would, I would probably be in support of, of, of that form of diversification. Multiple fund managers within an area, each having sole discretion over a portion of the budget. I agree with Nick. I think it would be great to have more funds within each area down the line, so to have multiple animal welfare funds directed by different people. I think the strongest criticism of the EA funds right now is the ideological conformity. Most of us running the funds also work at the Open Philanthropy Project, uh, which tends to be the biggest funder in these spaces. So we're primarily funding in line with what the biggest funder in the space is already doing. Uh, that has advantages in terms of our knowledge, and particularly we can avoid what we call funging, where we know the Open Philanthropy Project is going to put in the money anyway, so we can avoid kind of putting individual donors' money into the same place. Um, but I think there's definitely value to having more ideological diversity. And so down the line, it would be great to see different funds with different approaches from different people in the field. And so one of the things that EA Funds is doing is that um, it's increasing the variety of funding that's available or, or the, the source of funding that's available. Um, and how do you think this will impact the EA community? What kind of, again, benefits or drawbacks can you see here? Uh, you might need to switch. <laughs> hey. Um, so I think... EA funds right now is going to restrict viewpoint diversity. I think, I think that's what's happening. So I think a bunch of people were trying to figure out individually where they should donate, usually in December, usually by reading a bunch of long blog posts that other people had written. And then they're sort of synthesizing that into a donation option. And that gives you some additional viewpoints. A lot of it's based on the same source material, so it's not huge viewpoint diversity, but it helps. Um, and right now, I think a bunch of people who were doing that are just sort of giving the money to a fund and letting that person decide. Um, and I think there's tons, tons of cost to that, and that's not a long-term thing that I, that I would like to see. Um, what I'd like to see in the long term is it becomes easier for people who are doing a lot of thinking about these questions to have money that they can use to put towards what they've learned by thinking about the question. So in the way that um, Open Phil can attract people who want to think deeply about where money should go because they have some money that they can use, uh, maybe EA funds can serve a similar role where we can sort of attract people who want to spend a lot of time thinking about where money should go from a totally different viewpoint. And from my perspective, that's a big part of the medium-term goal for EA funds. Uh, basically in agreement with that. Don't have much to add. Same. OK. Um, and so kind of a last question on this topic of uh, diversity. Do you think, so again, right now, um, EA funds is kind of restricted to four cause areas. Do you think EA funds will add new causes? And if so, how would you go about doing this? Yeah, um, it bothers me quite a bit that EA funds has four causes. Um, and that's because I think the sort of sense that EA is about four areas is really arbitrary, as far as I can tell. Um, I think uh, the, the idea that EA is about uh, global poverty, animal welfare, far future, and EA community building is basically based on a blog post that got written after the first sort of EA community gathering. And I don't think the reasoning is too much better than that. It's like closer to that than I would like. Um, so I'd very much like to see a bunch of additional funds in EA funds. The uh, thing that makes that difficult, or the reason we haven't already done that, is you need to both have people who want to donate money to it and some sense of what projects you're going to fund with that money. And if you only have one side of that equation, the sort of setting up the new fund doesn't work. So trying to get both the money, like people interested in funding it, and know what, where the projects are, are going to go is the sort of challenge for adding a new fund. Um, and that, again, that's part of the medium to long-term goals for, for EA funds. I, I would love to see more animal-related funds in the longer term. I think you could do several funds around animal welfare. For one thing, people who are interested in the welfare of wild animals could be a fund. Uh, who are interested in long-term versus short-term interventions. So I think even within what we think of as a single cause area, all animal life on Earth is a pretty large cause area. So thinking about how there may be way, more ways we can break that down and, and address that piece by piece. 
So I, I want to move on a little bit um, to questions about impact. So we've talked a little bit about the structure of the funds and how this might look in the future. Um, but let's talk about this difference of uh, EAs who are interested in earning to give versus direct impact. So um, in addition to EA funds, I think there's just been uh, a, a lot more uh, funding sources in the in the last couple of years, especially with organizations like the Open Philanthropy Project being more open to funding a lot of the issues that EAs care about. Um, so how do you think this has changed the value of earning to give as a pathway of doing good? Um, I think that it has uh, decreased the appeal of earning to give as a strategy um, to a considerable extent. Um, so you know, in, in the areas that, that I think about most, um, in this context, you know, growing the EA, growing and improving the EA community, and addressing potential global catastrophic risks, um, I I see those as areas where previously uh, there, you know, it, there were parts of that where it was very difficult uh, to get funded through any other means, and I think there was sort of more of a story about why uh, there could be a lot of people for whom. Um, the best thing they could be doing would be, uh, you know, earning to give and enabling a bunch of that work to proceed forward. I think the the funding bottlenecks in those areas are uh, are a lot smaller than they than they used to be. Um, I think I don't think they all have, you know, necessarily as much money as they ideally would have. Um, but, you know, the most urgent needs I think are are, are largely being met now. Um, so. Uh, I think I think if someone is earning, it wants to have a, a, a big impact through earning to give. I think they, you know, it, in some ways they, they could they could do better um, by uh, making sure that they're putting a lot of sort of diligent extra attention into thinking independently for themselves about how the how the funding should be used. Because, um, you know, at least in those in those areas where I'm working, I I, I think, uh, you know. Doing an intelligent job to allocate all the resources currently available is sort of more of a bottleneck than than adding res adding, adding dollars to the queue. Yeah, I think there's been a bit of a tendency to seesaw back and forth within the community, where first everyone became activists, and then everyone said you need to earn to give, and now we're saying actually we need talent too. And I think one of the maybe more kind of long-term ways to think about this is just in terms of your own talents or your own comparative advantage. So if you're already at a hedge fund and you're really good at it, earning to give is probably a great idea. If you're already in a science program and you're really good at it, you're probably better working out how that science can, can have an impact. And, and so I think just thinking more deeply about people's individual skill sets rather than just trying to work out how can I do whatever would be in the abstract the highest potential career. Yeah, um, I mostly want to agree with, with both of that, especially with, with Nick. Um, the only sort of refinement I might add is if you are doing earn to give and you have kind of your own unique network of interesting opportunities, interesting people to fund, you're willing to spend some time to evaluate them, I think EA Funds actually makes that more valuable rather than less because of the restriction of viewpoint diversity. If the thing you're going to do is mostly go with what other people have said or other people's evaluations, then I think EA Funds makes that less valuable. So that'd be kind of an exception to where earning to give is no longer um, as valuable as it was. Um. Relatedly, um, with this question of impact, um, do you think um, EA funds would fund any specific projects um, by member, uh, that are taken on by members of the EA community? And if so, are there any particular projects that you would be interested in seeing? Give you a couple of minutes to think about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'll just say this, kind of a follow up to my previous comment. Um, I think. Uh, w w one thing that I think it would be great f to see more of in the EA community is people going and getting um, deep expertise in in a number of, of areas that are potentially relevant to the concerns of the effective altruism community. So I would love to see uh, more people going and getting um, working in AI strategy, getting uh, PhDs in machine learning. Um, Getting uh, PhDs in biology and thinking about you know how they could use that to affect or to to uh, to, to make valuable contributions to different areas like biosecurity or uh, developing alternatives to animal-based foods um, and uh, so I you know I, I could imagine using some of that funding if somebody were organizing some sort of method to you know get people trained up 
um, in some of these other areas, that, that might be an interesting use of it. I think uh, I'd rather let the ideas come from somebody else than from me, though. Yeah, I, I would love to uh, recommend funding to new initiatives or, or new work from the EA side of this. I think there are major frontiers and gaps within the farm animal movement. So thinking about fish and what we can do to help them, thinking about wild animal welfare, and thinking about the long-term recruiting pipeline and talent pipeline for the farm animal movement are all things that I'd be really interested in, in seeing more work around. One more I thought of. I would love to see uh, uh, EA community building and organizing um, in China and some other countries. Carrie, did you have any thoughts? Okay. Um, relatedly, um, how do you think, um, how does your allocation or does your allocation of EA funds differ from how Open Philanthropy Project would fund um, similar types of initiatives or cause areas? I'd say it doesn't differ hugely for me. Um, so uh, I think I, I plan to use it for, but I, I plan to use it for you know areas where there's something that I think is promising that maybe Open Phil would be less excited to support, um, and also maybe for some projects that are uh, you know a bit smaller, and I you know I'd prefer to spend less time sort of making the case for them and following up on it um, than which is sort of would, would be more of an expectation with open fill funding and less with this. I think there's the potential to fund uh, groups that are too small for open fill to fund. So we're typically not funding at the $10,000 or $20,000 level. So I think that's potential for this fund. Um, I think it's also going to often be the case that the things we feel most confident in are things that are already being funded by open fill. And I still think there's value there to building up the financial reserves or, or the uh, potential of those groups. One more thing to add to that, I guess, like, uh, it could also be cases where maybe, in my opinion, some grant should have been larger than what OpenFill wanted to make and we could top up with it. Um, <clears throat> so one other area that I uh, wanted to talk about is um, issues related to donor coordination. Um, so at a very uh, simple example, many donors um, in the EA community have chosen to split their funds among the different cause areas. What do you think of this? Do you think this is the best strategy for people to pursue? Do you think they should allocate all of their funds to the cause area they think is best? Um, I guess my view is, uh, and I haven't thought about this a ton, so don't, don't take the thing I'll say too seriously, um, is I, I think at the level of a community you want to split, but maybe at the level of an individual you want to donate to one thing. Um, so at the level of a community, um, the sort of costs of picking the one thing and having it be wrong maybe are much larger. Um, the sort of diversity of viewpoints you get if you pick one thing aren't, you know, sort of that, that has more of a cost. Whereas it, for an individual, I think you should uh, try hard to figure out what you think is best and then just put as many chips on the table as, as seems to make sense, uh, given what you think. Um, so that'd be maybe my rough heuristic. Um, I don't have a strong take on that. I, I could see the position that, that Carrie defended. Uh, the other position I can see being plausible is like maybe people should give in accordance with an allocation that they like wish the rest of the EA community would have so that we're not all trying to sort of like bunge each other and respect each other's autonomy. Um, but I, I, I think I, could, I can see both sides of, uh, of, of how that should be allocated. Um, and I also think, I guess the other, uh, the other thing that I think could be uh, defensible is sort of um, allocating some fraction sort of more for uh, something that emotionally resonates with a person or allows them to like maintain certain connections they have. I, I think that shouldn't be like the sort of main part of an EA's donation portfolio, but I think some can be good. I think everyone should give 100% to animal welfare. <laughs> uh, no, I agree with Carrie. Um, okay, so uh, one of the other um, uh, issues related to donor coordination in the community is, uh, Carrie, you mentioned this briefly. Uh, last year, uh, some members of the EA community decided to implement a donor lottery where you could um, pitch into a fund and have um, an opportunity to uh, determine how to allocate uh, a much larger sum than you normally would. Um, and so the rationale here is that not everyone kind of has the ability to do the appropriate type of due diligence for a fund, whereas if one person who has a large sum of money gets the opportunity to do that, they might be able to put in a lot more work. Um, how do you think this compares to EA funds, and do you think there could be any kind of synergy between the two? 
Um, yeah, I think this is maybe a, a sort of related to, but not the same thing as the sort of donor lottery approach. Um, the, the kind of problem you're trying to solve is if 10 people have $5,000, it doesn't really make sense for any of them to do a ton of work to figure out where the money should go. But if one person has $50,000, maybe it does. And I think EA Funds does also kind of solve that problem by collecting the money into one pot. Um, yeah, so that, that'd be my, my rough take. Um, I think that uh, the donor lottery idea is a, is a really cool idea. Um, you know, uh, Carl Schulman had a nice post on the Effective Altruism Forum explaining the, the rationale for it. Um, and I basically agree with all of that, uh, that post as it was written. Um, I think, uh, you know, this could be an attractive option for someone who maybe has some vision for uh, for how they would like to give away a large amount of money, and maybe it differs from the way that others are, are using it uh, on the EA funds or other places that they could donate to it, but they feel like you know, it would really take some work to figure out how to carry out that vision. I think uh, you know, a bunch of people throwing in for a, do a donor lottery uh, seems like it would make a lot of sense for such a person. Yeah. Um, and so an, another donor coordination problem that um, EA Funds aims to solve is the issue of moral trade. Can you guys perhaps give an explanation on this and talk about how EA Funds might solve that? So the thing was moral trade? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think of moral trade as kind of a long-term vision for the fund, but not a thing we do now. Um, so they do in moral trade is um, if if I think one option's the best and another option's the worst and you think the converse of that, but we have some intermediate option that we both think is kind of good, sometimes the better outcome for both of us is that we both donate to the, the thing that we both think is kind of good. That's not a great explanation. If you run into Will, you should ask him because he, he's the, one of the experts here. Um, but I think you could use, uh, if you have sort of a large platform with lots of EAs donating to it, I think that you could totally hook up moral trades. You could do a lot of other interesting coordination things by kind of having all the people donate through one sort of system that you can then use to sort of pair things off in, in the way that would allow the optimal allocation according to everybody's values. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, right now the way the funds is set up is that you can just kind of choose um, through the interface how much is kind of like allocated to each of the cause areas. If you did choose to implement something like um, having more open moral trades, like how would you go about changing the interface? Yeah, so I, um, I'm not exactly sure because I'd want to talk to Will or, or other people who, whose thoughts on this I, I take more seriously than my own. Um, uh, but probably the way it would work is you would need to assign some preferences to different options. Like, I think this one is this good, this one is that good. And then you use that to sort of pair off such that the global allocation is best according to everybody's preferences. But exactly how that worked from a UI perspective is will be a, a hard challenge if we decided to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so a couple of the other coordination problems that the uh, that EA funds uh, claims to solve is uh, again the last funder in problem um, and the funding uncertainty problem kind of in the same boat. Can you guys perhaps give an explanation of what these are and how EA funds might solve that? Yeah. So the last funder in problem is if uh, you're taking a single player perspective on funding, what you want is to give money counterfactually, meaning uh, but for your donation, the person the organization wouldn't have the money. And if you're taking that single player approach, you want to kind of wait to see if anybody else is going to fund. And then if not, at the last moment, jump in and fund them. And then you can be certain that you, you are counterfactually responsible for them getting the money. Um, hopefully, the kind of theme of this conference helps reveal why that's not a very good option. It doesn't seem like it's globally best. But also, EA funds kind of, again, centralizes the money. And that makes it kind of easier to know whether, they're going to, whether a group's going to get donations or not. And it means that sort of trying to game the system in, in, the, in that way doesn't work as well. Um, and then what was the other, the um, other one? The funding uncertainty problem. So this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, also if you're a strategic donor, you want to give uh, only the amount of money to a project that you need to figure out whether it's really good and to get the outcomes you want. And so it frequently makes sense to um, give as little as you can and give it for as short a time period as you can so you can sort of gain more information about whether the organization's going to work out and whether it's going to meet your funding priorities. But that's really tough for an organization who might need to make plans for longer than a year or for, for multi-year time frames. And so again, you can use EA funds and the strong expectation of future money that EA funds creates 
that knowing how much reoccurring donations you have creates. And you can use that to help solve that kind of problem by making a clear expectation that a group will get money in the future. So do you think there are any coordination problems that EA funds can't solve? Uh, I mean, the thing we already talked about is viewpoint diversity um, is, is a kind of coordination problem. Uh, it's a weird kind because, you know, the thing you want is for people to do sort of different things and have their own viewpoint. But as I mentioned earlier, I think plausibly right now we're making that worse and it's a thing that I'd like to make much better. And I think EA funds can do that, just not doing it at the moment. Yeah, I, I think the same thing. I think that having a number of different funds with different managers would provide a better total outcome in terms of a diversity of approaches across the movement. I think that each of us tries to be conscious of that within the Open Philanthropy Project and within these funds of supporting a variety of approaches, but we're necessarily limited by our own worldview and our own biases. And so having different people making those decisions, I think will be important long term for coordinating the kind of diversity of approaches we'd like to see. Did you have any? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I, so one criticism um, that I've potentially heard for viewpoint diversity is that I think it also increases um, the risk of like a unilateralist curse type situation where one person might fund a, an especially bad project. Um, how do you think the community can coordinate around this? Well, I mean, let me see if I follow this. So you could, yeah, so a unilateralist curse type situation would arise when there's some kind of thing that any one of a number of people could do. And uh, you know, if one of them does it, then there'll be some harm. And if there's some kind of like diversity of opinions about whether the thing is good to do or not, then uh, you know, if there's enough people, then probably one of them will do it. And you know, that, that, that can be risky. I guess I would, my first pass would be like, well, the funds would help with that insofar as they're centralizing uh, the decision-making process, um, you know, which has costs and benefits, but in this case, it's mostly benefits. Yeah, I think certainly uh, that in the farm animal space, there is always a risk of doing counterproductive forms of activism. And so I do think that giving through the funds reduces the risk that if you're kind of a low information donor, you don't know a lot about groups. One example would be you don't know if a group spends most of its time attacking other groups. Uh, through the EA funds, we don't support groups that spend most of their time attacking other groups. So that's like one form of risk that you, uh, that you avoid it. Uh, and I think there's certainly, you know, there's certainly downsides to this, but, but at the very least we avoid the kind of groups that could be doing real harm to the movement. So I, I'm gonna start taking some questions from the audience. Um, so one of the questions asks, is there a pass-through benefit to donating to EA funds? So um, I, I guess what they mean is do donating to effective charities does good, but donating via EA funds gives the charities the same amount of money plus helps enlarge the uh, EA funds funding profile in the philanthropy world. Do you think there's any benefit there? Uh, there might be a small benefit. So. Um if you're building a community that you want people to take seriously, putting some runs on the board, like getting some wins, is pretty helpful. And if all the money moves through a single platform, you can sort of say more about exactly how much money is being donated and where it's going, and that kind of helps um, with the sort of reputation of the community. I wouldn't treat that as a strong benefit or a strong reason to donate to the funds, but it's like maybe a nice small side benefit. Yeah, I see it kind of as an argument against donating to the funds. I think that the, uh, I think there are a number of other institutions that would benefit more from that, that would care more about the total amount moved. So within the animal space, animal charity evaluators, it's kind of an explicit goal how much they move. I think even within particular animal groups, if there's one that you feel really confident in, it's probably more valuable to them to have another major donor who they know is providing a form of diversified support that's not dependent entirely on the same person uh, than it is to just have more money moved through EA funds. I, I liked his answer better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question that we've received is that, um, so uh, again, looking at this issue of um, do we want to, or, or does EA funds want to fund uh, established and effective charities versus newer charities? Um, it seems like um, uh, sometimes there are risks taken um, in funding newer charities. Um, uh, I guess, um, what, what would you say to people who um, are of the opinion that EA funds should only fund uh, really proven or uh, charities that have like a really strong track record? Um, 
I think often, you know, I, I, I don't have a strong stance on, hey, should it be, should you do new and risky and unproven stuff or kind of established track record things? I think, um, you know, both of them have their place and, you know, the, the I guess, the, in grants I've made in the EA community in the past through through other mechanisms, a lot of it has been to newer groups, um, and I think you know it, it. I think some of the some of the best grants are that uh, fit that description. So I think it's important that donors who are giving to these funds or like that 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 I'm managing know know what they're they're in for in that way. That you know it might be used to support new groups and it could be a flop, but you know it also could be a big win. And I think that's a it's a fine way to go, just as long as they they are comfortable with that risk. I, I think it's reasonably clear that you need both funding for new organizations and funding for, for established organizations that have a proven track record. And so then, if you think that's true, then the question is just, well, what, what's your comparative advantage? Um, so if you have a network of interesting projects which are new, which other people aren't going to fund, probably just fund them. Um, and if you don't have that, then probably you know rely on uh, experts who you feel comfortable delegating to or you know, something like GiveWell's top charity recommendations or ACES recommendations or groups like that? Yeah, I think that if, if you want to support established groups, and I think that is often a very sensible thing to do, I think the easiest way is to donate to them directly or through animal charity evaluators. I think ideally in this context, we would be supporting new exciting initiatives, um, but it's often hard to know what those new exciting initiatives are, and inherently, as Nick was saying, it's going to be riskier, more of them aren't going to necessarily succeed. So I think longer term, that's where I hope EA funds will go is more in that direction of supporting more speculative newer initiatives. Um, but it's also the case that if you know of a new initiative and you think you have more information about it than we do, or just that we're wrong about it and, and you're right about it, then it might make sense for you to support that directly. Um, so another question is, how does this relate to uh, some of the other funding uh, opportunities that are either currently in place by the Center for Effective Altruism or have been in place? So a couple of things I can think of are things like EA Ventures or EA Grants. Maybe if you could give us a little bit of information about how EA Funds differs from those. Yeah, so um, EA Grants gives money to individuals to work on uh, projects where that's really broadly conceived, you know, anything from the organization you're starting to um, you know, I want to retrain as a programmer and I think I donate a bunch more money, but I need living expenses to do that. So it's sort of very wide range of things you can fund there. And I think EA Funds is going to uh, fund more things that are a little more established than some of what, what EA Grants might fund. Um, and then EA Ventures was a project I ran, which was on the, the failed projects panel, so you might guess it's not around anymore. Um, and EA Ventures was designed to sort of connect new projects with people who wanted to fund new projects. Um, and I think that didn't work because the, the kinds of new projects we were looking for weren't there, probably because the community was much smaller when we ran EA Ventures, and because um, it seems like you need to have the money already so that you can uh, donate to the organizations that you find with, with very little friction. And we had a model where we were sort of introducing people who wanted funding to the funders and then letting them figure out whether they actually wanted to fund them. Um, and so I think... Uh, I think EA, EA, uh, EA Funds is an improvement on that model and that we already have the money and we have trusted people who are going to decide where the money goes. Um, and I know we touched on this a little bit previously, but um, if, if, there is, um, if there are people who are interested in getting funding from the effective altruism community directly, do you have any specific pieces of advice you would give, them, give to them? I know, Nick, you said you're, you'd be interested in seeing people gain more expertise, um, but apart from that, is there anything that you think could help them? Yeah, so this is a question open to the entire panel, not just Nick. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a very easy answer to this question. Um, I think it is good. It, it depends on like how much money you're seeking and what, what kind of project it is. So, you know, I think it's it's good. It, it makes a lot of sense for people to raise the initial funding for projects they pursue from people who trust them and know that, that that are in their network and think, you know, this person's going to do a good job. I believe in them. I want to make a bet on them. And, you know, so you can start there and try to get from there to uh, a point where you have enough of a well-worked out plan or enough of some kind of demonstration of some kind of, you know, prototype or initial potential um, for what you have. And then I think at that point it's easier to, to get some, somebody's support um, some other strategies would be like, you know, applying through EA grants if, uh, if there's a future round of that. 
um, and uh, trying to get you know people who are kind of already trusted in the effective altruist community to endorse your project. So which you know, getting some initial plan sketched out and some initial results are, would be helpful for that. Yeah, I think we're still a small enough community that uh, reputation plays a huge part in um, whether you get funding, how easy it is to start a new project, how easy it is to get people to work for you um, if you have a new project. And so um, do things that make your reputation positive instead of negative, you know, be useful, start things that other people will notice and are useful. Um, and even if you fail to get funding for your project, you will have done something useful. So that would be the kind of strategy I would, I would take. Yeah, I would encourage people to think about the minimal viable version of your initiative and to just launch that and start with it. I think I at least get sent a lot of plans that haven't been implemented and that might look good on paper, but it's very hard for me to assess, is this person going to actually succeed with this? Are they going to develop a track record? Where it's a lot easier where someone who says, hey, I just launched this website a month ago, here's why it's unique, and here's the amount of traffic I've gotten through it. It's still a completely scaled down version, but if I had $100,000, here's all the amazing things I would do with it. And that's a far more compelling pitch because first I see that they actually can do things, and second, they can show that interest, that this idea actually gained some traction. Yeah, I, I agree with that a lot. Um, the first step in your new project is probably should almost certainly not be raise money. The first step should be figure out the thing you can do given the resources, time you have now, and s start putting something in the world, getting the feedback to see whether it works, and get the traction so that you then have something to show to people when you do want to raise money. Um, and so, touching on that, I think, uh, Nick, one of the uh, latest projects that you funded was the Berkeley Existential Risk Initiative. How do you think your process in funding that kind of ties into some of the comments that were just made? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk more about, so the Berkeley Existential Risk Initiative is, I think, one of the newer projects that were funded from the uh, EA community. So I was just wondering if you could talk about your process there. Um, it was a pretty lightweight process. It was a very much like a, a network-based grant. So. Andrew Critch is a person who started it and um, is a person I already knew and had a relationship with and he was addressing a need that um, that I thought was pretty obvious which was um, you know there are there are a lot of frictions uh, particularly often when working with uh, universities in terms of getting certain side purchases set up or hiring like certain types of research assistants and things like that where uh, if you have a kind of lightweight nonprofit who could just receive funds and provide assistance directly to people working in um, the field of existential risk. Uh, that could sort of just streamline processes, make things run more smoothly. And uh, you know, based on my understanding of Critch, it seemed like, yeah, this is a thing that he should be able to do. Um, and we'll be able to tell whether this is helpful to researchers in the field. So, so I guess that was a nice combination of, you know, uh, plan makes sense to me, addresses a known need, person seems well suited to the plan, uh, asked for funding for it, you know, I was, a natural, I, I was a natural person to recommend funding to support that project, and we'll be able to tell in the future whether, whether it uh, succeeded, so um, it was a pretty easy, easy choice. Cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the growth of the funds. Um, so uh, again, I mentioned this a little bit in the beginning, but um, since its inception, EA Funds has moved about $1.1 million um, and has about $31,000 in recurring donations. Um, what do you think the trajectory of the fund will be over the, the next couple of uh, months or years? And how do you think, or, or what are CEA's plans for it in the future? Um, the big question from a sort of trajectory perspective for EA Funds is whether EA funds will grow with the growth of the EA community or whether it can grow independently. So um, right now, all of the donors, uh, or nearly all of the donors are people who are into EA. Um, a lot of the money came from people will just sort of happen to meet and talk to about, about EA funds. Um, and I, I expect that to continue. But it's possible that this is a more mass market product where more people would be interested in being able to delegate their donation decisions to somebody who seems trustworthy. Um, and that's a thing that we haven't uh, validated a ton, and I'm not, it's not like the highest thing on my priority list, but it's definitely one option, and it's something I'll want to explore over the, the medium term. I think, I hope that it doesn't become the whole field of funding. I think that people who are passionate about farm animal welfare 
may well be better off if they have time on their hands or special knowledge uh, donating personally based off that or donating from animal charity evaluators. Where I think it's really useful is for donors who feel like they don't have a lot of time, they have more resources than time. Uh, we've had a number of donors come to us at the Open Philanthropy Project and say, can we just give through the Open Philanthropy Project? And right now, that's not an opportunity. And so this provides something similar for those donors who want to do something that they know will be good. It may not be the best, but it will be good within the space and don't have the time to research all those options. I think that my hope is that this will be kind of a growing, a growing space for donors. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those points. Um, I'm just reading a couple of more uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, let, let's talk about this issue of fungibility a little bit. So again, how do you, um, uh, especially in your kind of dual role as um, uh, program officers in OpenPhil and EA funds, um, how do you think that relationship will play out and uh, any associated questions with fungibility? Yeah, um, I'm trying to make the the grants that we're that we're making through that that I'm recommending through EA funds, um, you know, not be grants that just would have happened through through Open Phil, and I'm I'm in a good position uh, to do that. Um, I think a big uncertainty is going to be, you know, how how much is left over that you know I really thought should have happened, um, but maybe. Uh, didn't reach agreement with Open Phil on it, or how how often are we going to have sort of small-ish grants that are a better fit for this um, than Open Phil's process? And uh, I think you know we, I think that 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 sort of remains to be seen as uh, as as it plays out, and we're figuring it out as we go. Yeah, I definitely think this is one of the big advantages to having uh, people from Open Phil involved in the funds. Is that there are large disadvantages too, but I think. Uh, for instance, with this last round of grants, uh, Mercy for Animals is a group which I think is doing phenomenal work. Uh, they're one of animal charity evaluators, top charities, and we didn't make any funding recommendations to them through the EA fund this year, largely because I'm quite confident that the Open Philanthropy Project and other major funders will fill their room for more funding this year. Not necessarily next year, but this year. And so that's one place where we kind of have that additional insight into how much more funding they can use, how much more they're likely to get from the Open Philanthropy Project, uh, whereas you know an individual donor can't, can't have that as much. Um, I actually have a question, if that's okay. So um, what, one thing you might be concerned about is about too much funding coming from a single source. So if the Open Philanthropy Project was 100% of your funding, that's a huge risk for the organization. It might, it might mean that your funders pull you in the wrong directions. So I'm interested in how both of you think about um, kind of not wanting to over-concentrate the funding from a single source, where maybe the single source is you, um, even though you've got money from different buckets to, to donate. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, that that's a risk to the, to the organization. In some ways, it's also a, a big commitment for the funder, um, because you, know, you realize that you're sort of subjecting a, a grantee to that kind of risk, and I think that sort of inherently comes with more expectations about the level of care that you're using when kind of keeping up on their progress and you know that responsibility is not sort of shared so much between you and uh, you know another party or parties that that are interested in asking this group to pause and reflect on what they're doing and justify um, you know potentially controversial decisions to the funder um, so it, it's something that uh, I think, I think uh, you know, I have more of a threshold for, uh, I, think, I think the funding need has to be a lot stronger and more compelling for, uh, for me to want to recommend that OpenPhil become, uh, say, uh, substantially more than 50% of an organization's funding. But it's not an ironclad rule, you know, if, it, if, if there's something that seems like it really needs to happen and there's don't see another way someone else can come in to do it, then, then open, to, open to doing it. Yeah, I think this is a downside to having open philanthropy people uh, running these funds. The, I think one of the things the funds can definitely do is provide a more diversified funding source for groups where open philanthropy is providing half their budget or more. Um, but obviously, that diversity is less valuable for a group if they perceive it to be kind of controlled by the, by the same person. 
Um, so I do think there's a case for individual donors to give directly to a charity that they are excited about. I also think there's a case that open philanthropy, we should be better about signaling to groups that our support is longer term and that although we normally make grants on two year timelines, it's very unlikely we're going to pull all funding from a group uh, or do other kind of, I would call it irresponsible things like that. So I think that partly we can address this by better signaling our intention to provide long term support, um, but partly it's something that individual donors should think about too. Um. One other thing to add on that that I forgot to say as a qualifier, I think there's no problem with, uh, you know, being, being all of an organization's funding, say if it's a small organization, it's their first year or something like that, they're just getting things going, it can reduce frictions for them in, in getting things started. It becomes more of an issue when it's a, a larger organization that is really counting on being around in the future. Okay, so it's actually just about time for us to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to give the panelists the final opportunity if you had any final or closing thoughts about EA funds. <laughs> cool. I think we said it all. Okay, well, let's, let's give donate. Our, <laughs> yeah, let's give our panelists a round of applause.